Hi everyone, welcome to the Simbot Seminar Series, Episode 5. This week's episode is about the Chairman's Award. Uh, we've been giving these seminars for the past month, every Wednesday night. We've covered a lot of different topics, um, very robot-oriented topics, but this week we're going to change things up and uh, change pace. I'm going to talk specifically about the Chairman's Award and what it takes to win this award and how your team can um, improve and get to the position where you're ready to bring that big trophy home. So, um, let's just get started here, sorry, my contact lens is just all jacked up all of a sudden. So, yes. All right. Hi, I'm Karthik Kanigas of Apathy. I'm the lead mentor for Team 1114. Um, I've been with the team since 2004. And uh, in 2012, we were fortunate enough to uh, win the championship chairman's award and be inducted into the first Hall of Fame. Before that, we had a pretty long streak of regional chairman's award um, every year since 2006 minus 2007, which is a story that I might talk about later on today if you guys want to hear it. Uh, for my day job, I work for Innovation First International, who is a uh, crown supplier for First and a big part of my job is I'm the chair of the Bex Robotics Game Design Committee where I um, design the games that uh, the 10,000 Bex teams around the world play. So, But today we're he not here to talk about me, we're here to talk about the Chairman's Award. So here's an outline of what we're going to go over. We're going to talk, just kind of give an overview of what the award is. I know most people who are watching this today know what the Chairman's Award is, but I really want to re reframe it so everyone can get the right focus um, because I think a lot of teams Oh, sorry guys, I uh, thought I heard, got an alarm there. Okay, back to it. So, uh, we're going to really refocus because I think a lot of teams don't set their parameters right when they're working on the Chairman's Award. They kind of are just working without a plan and I think it's really important to always tie your plan back into what the award is. I mean, when you build a robot, you are designing and building a robot to play the game, so you analyze the game. But for the Chairman's Award, you're designing a presentation and a submission based around an award, so you really have to understand what the award is about and do that same sort of strategic analysis. Um, we're going to talk about what it takes to win, what you need to do, and then we're going to go over all the different sections and give tips when it, uh, for each and every one of them. So. Let's get started. What is the award for? A lot of people, you, you get asked this question a lot if you're involved in chairmen's, and a lot of people really don't give a good answer because the, it's very simple what this award is for. It honors the team that in the judge's estimation best represents a model for other teams to emulate and which embodies the goals and purpose of first. There's two parts there. This award is going to the team that is the best role model for other teams and we use the word best here because we're actually talking about the best of the best in the entire first robotics competition. So best role model for other teams and the team must embody the goals and purpose of first. So goals and purpose of first, that's like the mission of first. What is the mission of first? Again, let's use first's own words here. I think there's a lot of people out there who interpret the mission of first in their own terms and they kind of carry that with them. And it's very easy to lose track of what FIRST says their mission is and to start thinking about what the mission of FIRST is within your own little region because it varies from region to region depending on the leadership of the area. So the big picture mission of FIRST, to transform our culture by creating a world where science and technology are celebrated and where young people dream of becoming science and technology leaders. The mission of FIRST is to change culture, the culture of our communities, such that our culture is a place where young people dream and aspire to be science and technology leaders or rock stars, superstars. So the Chairman's Award is going to go to a team who is the best role model for other FIRST teams and who has done the most to embody the goals of FIRST and help achieve a culture change. This award is going to the team who is the best role model and the team who does the most to achieve the same culture change the first is trying to achieve. You've got to keep that in mind. This is like your criteria. Uh, you know, in the 2013 FRC game, the, cri the goal was to win matches by scoring more points than your opponent, and you got points for scoring Frisbees 
and hanging robots off a giant pyramid. And as such, you designed your robot to do those sorts of things. Now, you're designing your submission to best showcase what you do that makes you a role model for other first teams and what you have done to help achieve a culture change. Absolute, like, so many teams miss this step. If you miss this step right here, I, you guys can't see me right now. I'm waving my hands like a crazy person. But if you miss this step right here, you, you're gonna be you're gonna drift astray. You're gonna, it, it was just the same as building a robot without actually breaking the game down. Um, for those of you who've seen my strategic design presentation, the way we always approached uh, the Chairman's Award in 1114 was the same way we approached building an 1114 robot, and it starts with a strategic design. Okay, let's stop for a second and talk about why should we submit. Um, again, most of the people who are watching this tonight probably don't need any convincing. It's probably people who've been very experienced with this, but it's a common question. Why should we submit? And, and I'm not going to be doing saying anything revolutionary here, and but it's a it's a thing that a lot of people don't like to admit. There are a lot of people participants in first who don't like the chairman's award. They think it's a waste of time. They think it takes the focus off the robot, and they think it's very. Uh, I mean, the, the chairman's award is very idealistic. There's no other way of putting it. It really is, you know, for the team who helps achieve the mission of first. There's a lot of people who are very skeptical. Like, I, I think you can break the world down into ideal, idealists and skeptics. And for, in general, people, I'm generally a skeptic. However, I was really moved by the idealism of FIRST and the idealism of this award. And I, really, I, I firmly do believe that we can actually make the world a better place by a FIRST and a, helping achieve a culture change just by getting kids more excited about science and technology. But there's a lot of people who are very negative to this award. And within teams, you do need to answer this question of why should we submit? Why should we be doing this? So, you know, I say that all teams should, and many are already fulfilling the mission of FIRST. If you're already doing things to help inspire and to help change culture, you're ready to, win, to do a chairman's submission. The chairman's award, as much as we say it's about changing culture, the chairman's award is about changing culture, but it's also about documenting your efforts to change culture. You win the award for having best documented your efforts to change culture because your efforts don't necess won't necessarily speak for themselves. So. The Chairman's Award, in a lot of ways, is just an exercise in documentation. Now, documentation in general is important. Like, yes, the award is nice, and yes, being in the first Hall of Fame is a great honor, and get to go to the first championship every year, and hopefully that'll stay the same forever, and hopefully first doesn't take those spots away from teams, but that's another story. Documenting captures your team history. Everything you do in your Chairman's submission can be useful for marketing, sponsorship. Also, it helps you diversify your team and you can really provide avenues for students who have skill sets that aren't necessarily focused on building a robot. And it, it helps you create a much more well-rounded team. You'll have a wider cross-section of students. And if you have a wider cross-section of students, you have a better representation of what's going on in your school. And it'll, make, it'll be easier to get a culture change going in your school and your community. If you're focused on a very narrow segment of your school, the kids who are already interested in science and technology with your first team, it's going to be hard to get that to spread and blossom into a culture change. But if you have kids from all the different pockets of your school, like, you know, if your first team is kind of like the breakfast club of your school, I, I, this is an 80s movie reference that most of you won't get, but if you don't haven't seen the breakfast club, go watch it. Go Netflix it or whatever. It's awesome. But if you are really the breakfast club of your school, then you're going to have be reaching into multiple areas, and it makes culture shape change much easier to achieve. However, like, there's a lot of people who say, well, every team should submit for the Chairman's Award. Not necessarily true. It takes a lot of work. And we already know that building a robot with FRC is incredibly difficult. And a lot of teams barely have the resources to get a robot done. How are they going to have the resources to get a Chairman's submission done? As we've seen in this presentation, this Chairman stuff is not easy. So remember your golden rules. You need to have a priority list of what's important on your team. And remember that the jack of all trades is the master of none. So if, you, if you're a team with limited resources and you want to build a robot and do a chairman submission, you might end up with a not good robot and a not good chairman submission. So maybe it's more important to focus on something else. So 
I don't, I'm not going to be one of those draconian people that says, everyone should submit for the chairman's award. If you don't, you don't get for it. That's stupid. If it works for you, make it happen. I think it's really important. I think there's a lot of benefits from it, but I definitely understand why some teams don't. All right, let's get to the good stuff here. What do you need to do to win the award? There are six major criteria that go towards winning the chairman's award. Um, I used to say it was five major criteria. From 2013 and prior, the, uh, the way the executive summary was split up and the way the judging rubric was set up, it was very much that there was five major criteria and each one of them was a question. And so that was always like the target. You know, you would target those five criteria. Last year, they kind of changed up the executive summary, and obviously, uh, 1114 didn't work on our own submission last year, but we did help a lot of teams. So I went through and I looked at the criteria. They basically matched up to the old five criteria, except with an added sixth section. So we're going to go over these six major criteria. And this would be very equivalent to breaking down an FRC game where you're looking at the six ways you can score points or the six tasks to be competed in the game, whether it be pick up Frisbees, human load, blah, blah, blah. There are six major criteria, except for the chairman's award, they're pretty much all equally valued and you need to do them all. You cannot skip on these. So, the first criteria. How strongly does the submission document the impact first has had on the learning experience of the students, school curriculum, engineers, and or community during the team year as well as in prior years. So basically, what impact has FIRST had on the participants and the community? So, seems pretty easy. What has FIRST done for this team? What impact has FIRST had left? Now, mistake number one that 90% of teams make their chairman submission. They go, oh, well first, you know, it's it's all about the students, so we just focus on the students. How is first impact the students on our team? That is important, but you need to cover all the areas. And things that teams always forget to talk about is, how has first impacted the rest of your school? How has first impacted your mentors? Teams neglect this one. I, I rarely see a submission which talks about the impact first has had on the mentors. But you have to cover all the areas. So we want to talk about how FIRST has changed the lives of anyone who's been touched by FIRST. So, student graduation rates, the amount of scholarships that students have won. Um, one thing that uh, we talked about a lot in 11-14 is that the presence of our team led to a correlation of increased enrollment in our school, to which that we had the school board officials and the principals uh, basically attest to that uh, by... Governor Simcoe doing robotics, the school enrollment went up while other, other school enrollments went down. So that was a full way of how FIRST affected the school. Workforce success, employee development. Um, what I, a really neat thing that we focused on was uh, how our, our corporate sponsor, General Motors, used to use robotics as a way to train employees. Uh, when I was interning at GM, my responsibility was to be the lead mentor for 11-14. This is when I was still in college. But it wasn't just because they believed in this program. First was using the team as a way to train employees in a low-pressure environment because a first team, as pressure-packed as it is, is way low pressure than you know an engine plant where there's millions of dollars on moving across the line every day. But it was an employee development program to train their employees. So, Basically, GM was getting back from this, and that was a really neat way for us to show the impact on our mentors and the impact on our sponsors. So those are the sorts of things you're talking about. How has FIRST changed lives, and how has FIRST changed your community? Criteria number two. Has the team explained or demonstrated why and how it should be a role model for other FIRST teams to emulate? Going back to what we were saying the award is about, it is awarding the team that is the best role model. That if you look at the teams in the first Hall of Fame, these are the teams that everyone in first is looking up to and should be looking up to. And if you want to be one of those teams, if you want to be in the first Hall of Fame, you have to explain to the judges why you are the best role model. What are you doing that's the best that is helping fulfill the mission of first? So, um, 
one of the things I like to talk about with this presentation is how so much of what you talk about you're doing for the Chairman's Award, it's just like doing a job application, a scholarship application, or a university application. Because you're trying to sell yourself in any of those applications, you're trying to prove to the, um, the people who are doing the evaluation that you are the best candidate for the job. Here you're trying to prove that your team is the best team for the award. So you need to set yourself apart. What do you do that is unique, that you are the best at, that helps to fill the mission at first? A lot of teams just kind of do the standard things here. They say, oh, well, we started some FLL teams, and we were in a parade. Guys, pretty much every team who's competing for the Chairman's Award starts FLL teams, and pretty much every team who's competing for the Chairman's Award is in a parade. I don't know when parades became the de facto thing you had to do. Um, that's We'll get to that in a second. But it's important that you need to, if you just do talk about the standard things, your uh, submission is not going to stand out. The judges at some events are see, reading 30 submissions. You know, on average, I think it's about 15. That's a, you need to find a way to stand out so you're just not just a random person in the crowd. It's kind of like how, you know, like every university application can say, hey, you know, well, I have like a 3.8 GPA and I was in the band. That's great, but what makes you special? What sets you apart? So you need to talk about what you are the best at in your region, and if it's at the championship level, you have to talk about what you are the best at in the freaking world. It's that important. What is unique about your team that you are awesome at? So on 11-14, we had to focus on what was specific to us and what we were really good at. So we talked about team growth, because we had incredible success growing FLL, VEX, and FRC in our region. And we focused on FRC community resources. Because we were never going to be the team that did the most like charity outreach and like the most parades and like most demonstrations. That, is, that was not our team at all. But we did think that our scouting database, our kit bought on steroids, our Symphone app, was a whole, the textbook for success was a whole set of resources that was widely used in the first community that was unparalleled. And that's what we focused on. And when we did win the award in 2012, um, and when they were reading the award script, that's what they talked about. And Because they were going to talk about the things that you are unique at and you're the best at. So you have to focus on those things. Next criteria. How well has the team communicated its excitement and impact within the entire school community and beyond through participation at first during the team year as well as in prior years. Again, you need to focus on all three items. How has the team changed your school? Again, there's a little bit of overlap to the first criteria we talked about, but right here, it's spelled out. How has the team communicated this excitement and impact within the entire school? What have you done to your school? Tie it back to culture change, enrollment increases, new programs that have been started at your school because of the team. If your team's doing its job at the school, it's not just going to impact the 35 kids who are on the team, but it's going to impact the other 1,500 kids who are at the school. Uh, so, for example, if your team um, does some neat stuff and then a sponsor donates a 3D printer that is going to be used in all technology classes at the school, that's, an impact. that's somehow how your team has impacted the school. Because the first team is what allowed for that 3D printer to come to the school, and now all students get to use it. So that's the kind of things we're looking at. When you're talking about impact on the community, you want to talk about you know, charitable efforts your team has done, demonstrations that have gained interest and helped um, excite people about FIRST, and what local media involvement you've got. Beyond. What does this mean, and beyond? Most teams, their efforts are very much focused in their school and in their local community. But beyond is talking about what have you done on a national and international level. At a regional district level, to win a regional champion chairman's award or a district chairman's award, you don't necessarily need to have hit the national or international level. However, it is almost impossible to win the championship chairman's award without doing things that are touching your entire country and other countries. It's it's almost like one of the check boxes, you know, like. And it's crazy what teams are doing now with starting teams in Africa and, you know, like building schools in South America. It is, it is immense, but that's what Beyond is talking about. Next criteria. I think we're on number four right now. Has the team documented an innovative way to spread the first message? So lots of teams, well, 
do the same sorts of things. You know, like they start FLL teams, they run FLL events, they, you know, the parades, all that stuff we talked about. But what have you done that's unique to spread the word of first? So again, you need to set yourself apart. Because if the innovative way that you've come up with that you're going to talk about your submission to spread the word of first has been done by like six other teams in your region, that's not innovative. Innovative means like it's new, it's special. So you need to come up with things that are crazy unique. Uh, on Team 1114, some examples we had was um, we had a permanent exhibit at the Ontario Science Centre, which is the largest science centre in Canada, which displayed our 2008 World Champion robot along with a little ping pong shooting robot with that um, uh, one of our students made. So that was like a neat way that was unique. So every visitor to the Science Centre had an opportunity to see an FRC robot and learn about first and then get links so that they wanted to go start a team or stuff. Um, the coolest one, which was a centerpiece of our presentation for years and years, is that we had a chance to be on Degrassi, the next generation. Now, it wasn't just that we were on Degrassi. Uh, uh, I was very fortunate, and I had got the opportunity to help write the script for these two episodes. And these two episodes focused on a robotics team of um, a bunch of grade 9 students, and they were competing in a, in a robotics competition. So it, we actually got to you know show... Uh, millions of teens and some adults who watched Degrassi uh, all across the world about what robotics competitions were about. So that was like a very unique way. Plus, we were on the same episode as Drake, who is from the Six, from Toronto. So Simbot SS and Drake represented, which was awesome. Drake representing tonight at the Raptors home opener. Hashtag We the North. Just throwing that out there. But yeah, like we're we're basically bros with Drake. You know, it, it's kind of like or, or not at all. But, you know, we'll go with that. Uh, we did a demonstration at a Canadian Football League game, uh, created a curriculum that was used for all grades 7 and 8 students in a summer program. So, again, things that are big. You need to dream big with this stuff. The biggest one that we did was the Symphone app, where we, we had, knew we had all these neat resources, but we created an iPhone app for um, the teams to be able to uh, access all these things. How did we come up with that concept? Um, after the 2011 season, we knew we were very close to winning the championship chairman's award. We had talked to some judges and they told us that we were right on the cusp. So we said, okay, what are we going to do? We need to come up with something big and crazy. And so we just brainstormed. It's like, dream big. What could we do? And uh, one of our students said, why don't we do like an iPhone app? And then I said, hey, does anyone actually know how to make an iPhone app? And everyone kind of looked at each other and was like, no. But then one of our other students said, uh, I bet you we could figure it out. And that was the dream. And so it was a crazy huge goal, but we started early, like a full year in advance, and we worked over the entire summer on it and made it happen. So if you want to win a championship chairman's award, you need to think about this one and find your own innovative way to spread the message of first. And you need to start thinking about it now. And, like, this is one of those things where you may do it now and it may help you win the 2018 Championship Chairman's Award. But you need to dream big. There's no limits. And what's really crazy is that first kids have so much potential and there's so many awesome things you could do. Like, that anytime I hear a crazy idea that a team wants to do, it's like, wow, I think someone actually could do that at some point. And don't think about this just being for the award, it's more than that because if we never won a chairman's award, it wouldn't have mattered because the, I, the Symphone app helped so many teams. So if you just said, hey, our team is going to come up with a way to have um, robots um, help puppies with broken legs so they can still walk, that would be like an awesome thing. Like, no one's going to, even if you never win an award, you help puppies with broken legs walk. That is awesome. People, it, it, that's a cool thing. Like, that's not doing something just for the chairman's award. That's helping puppies with broken legs. So, and I'm sure, like, the, as stupid as that sounds, I'm sure there's some team who could come up with something crazy for that. But those are the big type of things we're talking about. Uh, next criteria, now that we're done talking about the puppies with broken legs. How well... I missed a word there. That's embarrassing. How well of a year-round partnership effort is reflected during the past team year as well as in prior years? 
you can define partnership in many ways, including the partnership amongst the team's students, corporate sponsors, blah, 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 blah. The Chairman's Award talks a lot about partnership. What teams miss, and this goes back to the first criteria, teams miss that partnership takes many forms and goes in both directions, like the arrow is pointed in both ways. It's very easy to focus on what sponsors do for students, but what do students do for sponsors? Picture your team and you set it up as a square where you have like your students in one corner, mentors in another corner, sponsors in the, uh, another corner, and then uh, the school in another corner. Let's make it a pentagon. And then you have like uh, your community. Then draw lines between all of them with arrows going back and forth because you want to find the partnership is two ways in every direction between all different groups. This is an easy, easy way to set yourself apart with so few teams. Everyone's so focused on what, you know, the teachers have done for the students. We don't know what the students have done for the teachers and how the teachers have gained opportunities by being a participant at first. So talk about the partnership in both directions and how it impacts the people that at least get talked about. And that's a great way to set yourself apart. Um, the amount of, you know, as a former first MC, I've had the opportunity to listen to, to read a lot of award scripts for teams who won the Chairman's Award. And the things that always stand out, it's like, this team not only, you know, has an impact on their students, but they've managed to find a way for their students to impact the sponsors. Like, those are the kinds of things that the judges are looking for. So it's important that you really cover that. So, yeah. Um, one example is there's a lot of um, sponsors who use FRC teams as a recruiting tool for their employees. For example, like, um, if you are, like, a top graduate from a top school, uh, I, I, this is gonna, this is hard to say right now because the economy is kind of a mess still, and there's a lot of people struggling to find work. But the top grads from the top schools are still getting offers from multiple companies, and the companies are recruiting really hard, and they're fighting for these top students. There are some companies now that are trying to lure recent grads to the companies by providing them with more opportunities than just work, with employee development things and the such. But a lot of sponsors around here are saying, hey, we also sponsor an FRC team. So if you come work for our company, you get to play with robots in your downtime. If you, know, if you want, you can play with robots in your downtime. And that's a way that first has impacted these sponsors because it's helping them attract high-level talent. So one thing to think about. The last criteria. I have weird feelings about this criteria. I'm not going to try and rant here. Uh, in the past, the first five criteria were the criteria. And one of the things that a lot of teams talked about in that criteria was how they've helped grow first. Because that's obvious. Growing first is a way that you help demonstrate culture change, you help create culture change, and it's a really good role model characteristic. The Chairman's Award now specifically calls out growing first. There's four sub-criteria. Describe the team's initiatives to help start or form other FRC teams. Describe the team's initiatives to help start or form other FIRST teams, including JFLL, FLL, and FTC, and so on and so forth. You can read the slide. I don't need to read everything there. But basically, you need to, in your submission, talk about what you've done to grow FIRST. FRC, JFLL, FLL, and FTC. Now, for some, there's no FTC in the region. The judges are not going to hold that against you. Uh, there's been a lot of teams, I, I mean, 1114 won the championship chairman's award, and one of the biggest things we talked about was starting VEX teams. And the judges ate it up because we were helping change culture by getting schools involved with robotics and STEM. It was the same same difference. Yes, it wasn't part of the first family of programs, but it's not all about that. Um, when Team 842 won the chairman's award, they a big part of their submission was be participating in the underwater robotics challenge. Lots of first teams talk about starting best teams and whatever. Like That's all important stuff. That should all go in your submission. But you do need to talk about the specific things you've done to help grow first. Um, again, 1114 has not been a chairman sufficient since 2012. So I don't know how much this part is having an impact on the judging process. But you definitely wouldn't want to overlook it. It's one of the major criteria. Okay, so now we talked about what you need to do to win this award. Just checking the time here. Whoa, time flies when you're having fun. Um, let's talk about what you shouldn't do. So let's all get together, guys. Let's come, come close together, and let's have a real talk here. 
I, there's going to be a lot of these real talk moments. Right? This is like real talk with Karthik, right? Please don't do things solely for the sake of winning the chairman's award. A lot of teams do this, and it just feels like it's not genuine anymore. You want to do things that your team actually wants to do. For example, if your team hates puppies, don't try and help puppies with broken legs. Like, that would be silly. Like, you know, do what you want to do that you're passionate about. When you do things that you actually want to do, you're doing things that you're passionate about, you're excited about, you can give a better effort for. You are invested in the idea, you're going to naturally do a better job, and you'll make a larger impact. Also, there's teams, it, it needs to be associated with the award. I hear the most random things, you know, like I remember on 11-14, we had this ridiculous conversation like six, seven years ago. We're like, we need to plant trees to win the Chairman's Award. I was like, what? They're like, yeah, if we don't plant trees, we're not going to win the Chairman's Award. I was like, how does that make any sense? The Chairman's Award doesn't grow on a tree. They're like, yeah, but if we don't show that we're, uh, you know, like lowering our carbon footprint and planting trees, the judges will never give us the award. It's like, no one wanted to plant the trees. And two, it just made no sense. It was so stupid. Like, you need to actually do things that are focusing on the award that your team actually wants to do. Because otherwise, you'll then become one of those teams that where people are forced to do things for chairmen and kids aren't engaged in them. And you're, it's just not a dynamic that is good. And it's how it's very easy for teams to get jaded and not be a fan of the chairman's award and not care about it. So focus on doing what you love and what you're good at. Every team has their own identity and their own strengths. On 11-14, we have the identity of a team that is very robot-focused, very professional, and very bang, 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 go, go, go. So instead of focusing on, I don't know, planting trees or you know kissing uh, babies at the mall, we focused on what are we good at? We're good at building robots. Let's teach people how to build better robots, and let's work on resources for that. And that's where our focus lay. Don't try and be someone else. It's very easy for teams to look at the teams that win in their area consistently and say, okay, what are they doing? We need to do the same things. Well, one, what works for Team X might not work for Team Y. But two, you're never going to beat them if you try and do the same things as them. That's playing their game. Like That's kind of like seeing you know, 2056 and 254 and 67 on the same alliance of champs and saying, oh, okay, let's just go and try and outscore them. No, you cannot play their game. You have to play a different game. You have to be the best at what you do. You have to find something unique that will set you apart. If you try and do the same things that the other teams in your area are already doing, you're just going to pale in comparison. And I've seen that a lot in a lot of regions where teams are just trying to be do what the previous winners have done. Find your own thing. Find what you're passionate at, about, what you're good at, and focus on that. The Chairman's Award is a team award, much like anything at first. Uh, everyone on the team needs to be behind the effort. Like, there's no way a team can win the Chairman's Award, an award which is going to celebrate the team which has done the most towards creating the culture change, if that culture doesn't even exist within the whole team. Um, on 11-14, you know, for the first few years of us doing chairmen's, I'll completely admit the chairman's team was kind of separate from the robot team, and it was a weird dynamic, and I never liked it. And then in 2008, um, we had some kids graduate and some kids quit the team, and it was like the best thing that could have happened. Because all of a sudden, in 2010, I kind of said to the kids, like, okay, we lost a lot of the chairman's group before. Do you want to actually submit for this award this year? It is up to you. And I, I walked away and came back in, and they said, yes, we absolutely are submitting for this award. I said, okay, then this is your award. You've got to do it your way. And from that point on, if you wanted to be a student leader on 1114, you had to be part of the chairman's sub-team. Was, there was no chairman's team and robot team. It was one team, and everyone believed in it. And in 2012, like members of our drive team were slaving to the last minute working on the chairman's board and the chairman's video. And the whole team really believed in it. And it was easier. We had a small, small team when we won in 2012. But having the whole team into it and having the whole team believe in the award was what allowed us to go to the next level. So I think this happens a lot on very large teams where you have like some kids who only work on chairmen and never touch the robot. 
and some kids who only work on the robot never touch the chairman's submission, and that's dangerous. I think it's important that the whole team's behind it, and for the whole team to behind it, like we talked about this when it comes to scouting, your leadership needs to be behind it. The kids that the, that the students look up to need to be promoting the chairman's award. So, and it goes both directions. The chairman's kids need to be interested in the robot and focused on that. Um, our best chairman's presenters were all, almost always our best scouts as well because they were robot junkies. So that talks about what you shouldn't do. Um, I can't believe I didn't put something else on here in the what we shouldn't do, but there will be a rant coming up when we get to the essay about what you shouldn't do. Get ready. Okay, now it's time to do the submission. We talked about the criteria and everything, and this presentation is taking longer than I thought it would. Apologies, guys, but I'll try and move along. The entirety of the submission needs to cover the six major criteria while fitting within the limits of the rules. This is just like building a robot. You know, with your robot, you would say, okay, the functionality that we have has to fit within the limitations. When building a robot, you are limited to a 112-inch frame perimeter, 120 pounds of weight, one battery, one pneumatic compressor, uh, X number of motors, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to work within those constraints, and you have to tailor things around it. With your submission, you're going to have lots of things you want to cover. However, you will not be able to cover them all within those constraints, so you have to pick and choose. Chairman submissions are limited to a 10,000 character essay, a five-minute presentation, a five-minute question period, a three-minute video, and then X number of characters with executive summary. you got to focus on your high-priority items. If you are a team competing for the championship chairman's award, you have hit this dilemma by now. If you are a team who's really on the cusp, where you have too many things to talk about and you cannot fit them into your submission. This was always a problem at 11.14, where in the first draft of the essay, it would come in, we just say write, we just tell the kids, write whatever you want. And it would come in at about 25,000 characters. And then we had to cut it down to 10,000. And there's no way you can just trim by, you know, like the source scene to go from 25,000 characters to 10,000. You have to cut out on giant chunks. So like a robot, you know, if you wanted to build a hangar and a, a floor intake in 2013, you know, probably weren't going to be able to do both, so you have to focus on your high-priority items. For chairmen, you've got to pick the most important things you do that hit the most criteria and focus on those. On 11.14, you know, in our last year, we focused on Degrassi and the symptom. Don't needlessly duplicate. Don't say the same things in the essay that you say in the presentation that you'll talk about in the question period. You can't, it wastes resources. A lot of teams, their presentation is basically them reading their essay out loud, and that is a terrible waste. You, your resources are so limited here. 10,000 characters, five-minute presentation. You cannot needlessly duplicate. You should absolutely duplicate on your most important things, but other than that, you want to try and get as much information as you can. So each portion of the submission can be used to tell, tell a different portion of the story. A lot of teams try and divide things up by the major criteria. However, um, this is one of the, the formulas that we used in 11.14. We tried to divide our submission up by style. Bear with me here. This is probably the most important part of today. We used our essay solely for getting across factual information about our team achievements and endeavors because facts are easily presented in a written format. So you write them all out, what the team has accomplished, what the milestones were, you put them all on paper. We use the presentation to tell the story behind the numbers because you can convey things with enthusiasm. Like a talented writer can convey emotion and enthusiasm in text. It's difficult. It is much easier to do it with your voice and with your body language in a presentation. So we use the presentation to tell the story behind the factual information and the numbers that were in the essay. We emphasize the key points in the essay by drawing attention to them with your voice and paying, this is what's important, this is what we're awesome at, this is why we rock. We went very much in depth on things that might have been touched on briefly in the essay because this is the time to go in depth because the judges will remember it because this is the last thing they're going to see from your team. They will read the essay in advance but the presentation is, has a chance to be more impactful and stick with them. So you want to go in-depth about the important things. 
So you highlight, you focus on what's really, really important in the presentation, you go in depth, and you use your personalities to tell that story. The video. We use the video to tell the emotional side of the team story. Because the essay is kind of about facts, and the presentation is kind of about telling the story behind those facts. But what's the motivation of the team? What are the emotions that it goes to? What does it mean to be a member of your team and to be impacted by what your team has done and creating culture change? Who has been impacted? Let's see the, what the impact is. The essay can talk about the numbers of people that have been impacted and the degree they've been impacted to, but the video tells the emotional side of the story. It is so much easier to convey impactful emotion through a carefully edited video. And so that's what we use the video for. The video was telling the emotional side. The kind of, you know, it, we'll talk more about the video later, but video emotions. The question period. The five minute question period is used to reinforce and clarify key points. So the judge is going to ask you questions. So you will answer them to clarify what they're questioning, but then you will also try and introduce new information to the judges to reinforce the main points you're getting at. Finally, the executive summary. A lot of teams use the executive summary just to rehash what's in the essay. That is a waste. They're going to get the essay and the executive summary at the same time. Use the executive summary to make things into a digestible format, but also use the executive summary to introduce facts that didn't fit within the rest of the puzzle, that didn't fit in the essay or presentation. Throw them into the executive summary so at least it gets mentioned. The better this puzzle fits together, the more cohesive it'll all be. Think of these as puzzle pieces, guys, and you want to get them as close together, and you want to work to eliminate gaps so that you've covered everything. If you tailor your submission this way, it is so much clearer to the judges of what you've done, and it's much more impactful. This whole plan here is the, it's like the secret sauce of chairmen. You get this all together, with combine that with a team who's actually achieved the culture change and is a role model team, but you use this format to document and show the judges what you've done, this equates to a winning submission. There are lots of teams who have done the right stuff in their community, and they, they're, they're creating culture change, but they've never won the chairman's award, or they've never won the championship chairman's award, because they just can't get it across to the judges in the most clear way. This is a style that can be very clear and very effective. So, tie into all that, we talked about the puzzle making it all come together. This is a common, common question we get. Should we have a theme? A lot of teams will theme their chairman's submission around something because a theme is an easy way to make the puzzle look more complete. It provides a sense of unity. Um, themes are pretty cool. I, I think you can do good themes. Um, you know, the past examples for 11, 14, uh, in 2012, our theme was a museum tour where our presenters were literally leading the judges through a museum exhibit which talked about the history of our team because it was our 10-year anniversary that year. Um, that was a neat thing to do. Um, one of the most famous ones in 2005 when Hot won the Championship Chairman's Award, theirs was the recipe for success and their presenters came in dressed as chefs and they had platters and they opened things up. Um, this brings up an example. Please do not plagiarize themes. It is, it is embarrassing. I've seen other teams just reuse themes that have been used by past winners and it, is, I, I, it bothers me beyond belief. Plagiarism, and we'll talk more about plagiarism when we get to the essay, is absolutely unacceptable. Don't do it. Um, when theming your submission, you could theme the entire submission or just the presentation. Um, we never like to theme our essays because it wasn't a good fit to try and just like mention a museum every so often. So, well, I shouldn't say we never did. We probably did in the past, if I recall correctly. But you could try and theme everything or just theme the presentation because the presentation is the more visual medium. So. But don't force a bad fit. Don't try and if you were trying to work on a theme and then you can't make it fit, it's better just kind of abandon the theme and just leave things clean. Uh, the theme should definitely fit within your team's branding and your team's identity because then it helps unify everything. And like I said, themes are a great way to unify the puzzle. So fitting within your team branding makes sense. Um, also, being topical is good. Uh, in 2012, not 2012, in 2010. Canada hosted the Winter Olympics in February, so our theme, when we submitted it in March that year, or the essay was due in February, we themed ourselves around the Olympics, 
and that was a topical theme that you know fit with the judges and uh, you know it was very neat and then we had the opportunity one of our students was um, part of the Olympic torch relay in Canada that year and he had the opportunity at the opening ceremonies of, the of a couple of the Canadian regionals to run the torch through the regional so it all kind of tied together and themed together so being topical is very cool like that so things that are topical right now I mean like there was the World Cup this past summer um, I don't know. There's, there's other things that are topical too. So when you do something topical, please don't do something stupid that's like controversial. I, I don't even need to state the examples of all the dumb things you could do to be topical right now to try and be like somewhat witty. It's like the person who dresses up as like a controversial like political figure for Halloween. Most of the time you're just being that guy and it's really uncomfortable. So be intelligently topical. Like don't theme your presentation about Ray Rice or something stupid like that. Okay, the essay. Start early, like now. There's nothing preventing you from working on your chairman's essay before the season starts. Uh, first, the criteria for the essay changes very little from time to time, and if it does change, then you can just change your essay up. But start now. Uh, we, in the 2012 season, we tried to have most of our essay done before kickoff, so more time could be spent on the presentation of the rest of the submission. You need to start early because you need time to edit, review, and rewrite. Um, one of the most important pieces of advice I got from a high school English teacher was, she said, the key to effective writing is rewriting. And a, a good chairman's essay is not something you write the night before it's due and just hand in. Um, if you're handing your essays in school that way, you're probably not optimizing your outcome, your output. Good writing means you write it once, you read it, and you fix things. And you have someone else read it, and you fix it. You edit, review, rewrite. Essay writing is an iterative process. So you have to start early so you have more time. 10,000 characters, which is about 1,500 words, doesn't seem like much. It is not much. It's not many. I can write a 1,500 word essay probably in about like 15 minutes. It's, it can be done. You know? like that's not a problem. However, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be effective. You know? like, don't treat this like a two-hour English exam. You have months to work on this. You want this to be a masterpiece. This is the biggest chunk of your chairman's submission. Start early. Re write and rewrite. The other thing is, once your team gets to a level where you're very competitive for this award, you're going to have a lot of content, and your essay is going to come in over 10,000 characters. So you need time to be able to edit and pare it down. But while paring it down, you need to make sure that you don't lose a lot of the original meaning. So you have to read it again and then build it back up. So start super early and leave yourself time for the iterative process. Um, have the essay proofread by multiple people, not just people on your team. Get people outside your team. Get other teams to help you. Hall of Fame teams will help you. Get professional help. Talk to the English teachers in your school. Talk to someone like who's a professional proofreader or an editor. Like if you have good links with your local newspaper, send the essay to one of the editors. They, know, I mean, journalists know how to make things sound exciting and how to sell stories. That's a great opportunity to engage another uh, industrial partner, which is another partnership. You know, like that ties into the chairman's award. Here's a really important one, and this is like important. Did I say this is like important? It's not like important. This is important for not just your chairman's essay, but for any any resume, job application, or scholarship application. Use numbers and statistics to illustrate the impact of what you're doing. You know, saying that um, as a result of our team, more of our students went on to study engineering. That is good. That is. It's like factual, but it's not impactful. Anymore. Now, just using raw numbers without context is the next step, but that's also weak. You could say 68% of our students went on to study engineering, but that doesn't tell me anything because maybe before the team, 80% of your students were going on to study engineering. It might be a result that your team showing up has caused less students to go on to study engineering. So you need to provide context. So a better way of saying this is, 68% of our students went on to study, I should say engineering, that is a stupid typo, 68% of our students went on to study engineering, 
which is an increase of 35% since our team's inception and is 42% higher than the national average. That is a useful statistic, and that illustrates impact. If I read that, I'd be like, uh, ah, yeah, this team's doing stuff right. However, effective statistics take time, need a lot of research. This is not stuff you can just like make up. You have to actually find out how many teams were studied engineering in the first year of your team and look at how that's grown. You need to research to find out what the national average of students studying engineering is. You need to delve deep into this. This is something that if you have a big team and you have a square and strategy team, which is broken down into you have a little analytics section there, use those people to help you research and find these statistics and you can do really cool things. And then you can tie these statistics, you can do some visualizations which we'll talk about in the presentation later to make this more effective. Now, when you're going to talk statistics, you need to make sure all your numbers are verifiable. More and more teams are using numbers in their submissions, which is good. However, some teams are using BS numbers in their submission. Actually, a lot of teams are using complete garbage fake numbers, just making them up out of thin air. I heard one team, and they actually said this, they said that they mentored uh, over 300 teams, FRC teams. Okay, that's fine. People can say what they want, but you need to make your numbers verifiable because there is a certain, among judges and amongst people in the FRC community now, people are skeptical of any statistics that teams are throwing out in FRC submissions because so many teams have been BSing their statistics. So, you need to be above reproach. You need to be able to back up every single claim you make. One of the things that we talked about in our submission in 2012, we said that 1114 has impacted over 6 million people. That's a huge number, and that's a big claim. And we knew we would get called on it repeatedly. So, in our chairman's presenters and our essay, we broke down that 6 million piece by piece. And for every single claim we made, we had basically a virtual footnote. We had a letter from an organization. Like, we had the ratings from Degrassi. So we had Degrassi state that this episode was watched by this many people. Ooh, that's a fact. We had attendance figures for demos we did. We had letters from the people who organized these events right there. You need to be able to back up every single claim. And then your numbers become that much more impressive. Please do not exaggerate or lie because by doing so, it's completely unethical. And two, you're, it brings, it casts doubt upon every other team's submission. And that's just not fair. And the fact that teams have to do this extra work now with the virtual footnotes and that sort of stuff is because there's been so many teams who've been shady with their numbers. Don't be that team. You never want, because it is embarrassing. Even if you win the chairman's award by exaggerating numbers, you will be embarrassed when your team wins and the MC reads out the judge's script that says, and this team did X number of blah, 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 and then everyone in the stands is like, there's no way they did that. That's not true. And they're like, oh, look, I, have, I can prove that they didn't do that. It happens all the time, and it's really, really embarrassing. You don't want to be that team. No one wants to be that team. You want to win and be above approach. Don't drag people down with lies. Rise above your opponents. The next thing, do not plagiarize. This is another thing that's been happening more and more with chairman's submissions, where a lot of teams, and bless these teams, they will publish their chairman's essays on the web. And there are other teams who are copying directly out of teams' chairman's essays into their own. That is not acceptable. And if you try and do that stuff in school, you might be able to get away with it in high school, but when you get to university, they use more and more services that analyze your papers, you will get caught and a plagiarism black mark in the world of education sticks with you for the rest of your life. It doesn't go anywhere. It can ruin careers and degrees. Please do not plagiarize. It is a, I have a very dim view of cheating and cheaters in general, and plagiarism in the chairman's award is cheating. Teams do it, and it's unfortunate. Uh, it, this, this goes back to the exaggeration point more, because the exaggeration is definitely more common than uh, plagiarism. But a lot of teams feel that they have to exaggerate their numbers because they want their numbers to sound as good as another team who may have exaggerated their numbers. And it's like this stupid like, like steroids in baseball where people feel they need to do it to compete. Just stop. Don't plagiarize. 
please don't. Anyways, let's talk about more positive things, because that's a lot of negativity right there. Okay, presentation. Presentation needs to be the most positive thing you're doing. We talked about this earlier, using the presentation to tell the story behind the facts in the given essay. You're not want to, do not want to duplicate or replace the essay with the presentation. The presentation needs to complement the essay. Remember, we're talking about puzzle pieces, fitting things together. You don't want to overlap. You don't want your puzzle pieces sitting on top of each other. You want them to mesh and fit together. Who should be your presenters? Choosing presenters for chairmen, similar to choosing presenters for the drive team. Here's the skill set that I was always looking for on 11-14. I can't believe I missed the most important thing, but the first is they have to be passionate about the chairman's award. They have to care about this award. This award needs to mean a lot to them because I want them to be 100% dedicated to this. I want them to desperately want to win this award. They have to have that competitive spirit. They also need to be outgoing, enthusiastic. They have to be energetic. They need to be well-spoken, calm under pressure, quick thinking. A lot of these skill sets, especially the outgoing and enthusiastic part, not actually found on many FRC teams. So you might need to recruit. I've seen teams school um, who recruit grammar students to be chairman's presenters. Grammar students make amazing chairman's presenters. Um, kids who have gone through the pageant circuit are trained to answer questions from judges and are trained to give uh, give speeches. Pageanters are amazing chairman's presenters. So that's the kind of skill set. So you want someone who can represent your team well, answer questions, and speak from the heart, and who's intimately familiar with what your team has done. However, you can train someone on the history of your team. You cannot necessarily train someone to be outgoing. Learning to be a good public speaker, I think I've talked about this more later, or maybe I don't. Public speaking is not easy, but you can become better at it with practice. Um, one thing that's really, really important for chairman's presenters, I always say, is watch a bunch of TED Talks before you do your chairman's presentation to get tips on how to be a better public speaker. Learn from the best. Watch um, some of the great speeches from, I, I mean, uh, for all the Americans out there, so there have been some of the, the American presidents of the past, say what you want of their politics. There's um, it's so many amazing speakers, Obama, Clinton, Reagan, Kennedy are some of the best public speakers that I ever watched their old speeches. First of all, you'll learn something about the history of your country, which is important, but you'll pick up on things on what they do to sell um, their message. News anchors, another example. How should your presenters look? I, I get this question at all. It's like, what should our presenters wear? How should they look? Well, they should look good. Like, I mean, <laughs> is that one that hard? They shouldn't look bad. Um, um, a more appropriate question is, what should they wear? Um, I've always felt that you should either go with a very professional look, so like go shirt, tie kind of thing, or dress, or like, you know, business suit, whatever, or maybe tie it in with your theme. Or some teams just want to go in their team uniform and fit their team branding. All are expect acceptable. Uh, I personally am a fan of the more professional look, but a lot of people feel differently about that. However, you need to make sure your presenters are comfortable. These events are long days, so they have to feel comfortable in their own skin. There are some high school students who absolutely abhor wearing a suit or a dress. You don't want to force someone into like you know wearing a dress and then being uncomfortable for the whole day. So, because when you're uncomfortable, you're not going to be as confident, and confidence is the key for public speaking. Uh, what visual age do you use? You should have some sort of visual aid in the presentation because it's useful for the judges so they can kind of follow along with what you're talking about. And it's useful for the presenters because it, it gives the presenters their cues and it gives them something to kind of point. Like if you're not presenting, you can point at the presentation board or point at the projector screen. And that gives you something to do with your hands because a lot of presenters struggle with what to do with their hands. Um, some teams prefer to use PowerPoint via projector. That's awesome. However, you will need to supply your own equipment, and your setup time counts towards your five minutes. The five-minute presentation, like they are strict at the championship, that when you walk in the door, the timer starts, and they will cut you off at five minutes. So if you spend 30 minutes plugging in a projector and everything, you're wasting time. So you probably want to bring something that you can just wheel right in, self-contained power unit, and 
go, go, go. On 11.14, I didn't like any of those variables. And if you watched our scouting presentation, I talked about how I like paper scouting. I like presentation boards, things that were pre-printed, quick to set up, no technology. You basically plop an easel down, put it up, bang. So the next couple slides are examples of our um, presentation boards. Um, you can find all our past, not all of them, but our most recent presentation boards um, on our website, uh, symbotics.org, in the outreach section. And I believe that on the sidebar of uh, tonight's uh, stream on Google+, you can, uh, we have a link to that there, too. So here's one of our presentations. This is the one from our museum year, the year in 2012 and one. And you can see how it's kind of organized. The presentation kind of flowed through those 10 um, little sub subjects there. And they all represented a section of the museum. So that was visual tied with the theme. And it had a lot of content on there. Also, by putting these words up there, it gives you another opportunity to get things across the judges that isn't part of your 10,000 words for your essay or your five minute presentation. We always made sure to give a printout of these to the judges as well. So they would have it afterwards, so they could, you know, when they're talking about the team, they would be like, oh yeah, well this is here and this is here. It gives them something to highlight as well. Here's one from our year where we did the Olympic theme. You can see the Olympic rings in there, except they're years kind of thing. You can see Muck Muck and Quachi, the Olympic mascots, which uh, Quachi was the name of our robot, so that was kind of cool. Uh, yeah. Okay, question period. This is another one that ties back to job interviews and stuff. So pay attention here. This is how, if, if you do this stuff right here, you will get every job. You will, not every job. But you, know, you might not be qualified, but it'll help in getting jobs and uh, winning scholarships. You only have five minutes, and the judges will ask you questions. It's vital to clarify and emphasize points from both the essay and the presentation. So when answering questions is a lot like playing tennis. There's three ways to return a shot when you play tennis. Someone hits the ball to you. Now, you can run to the ball and just hit it and get it back into play. That is the most basic step. A better tennis player will run down the shot and hit it and try and get it within the in play by their opponent. So they're going to hit to their opponent. A better tennis player will hit it, try and get it away from their opponent, but still in the field of play. The best tennis player will try and hit the ball to the other side of the court, which will then force their opponent to hit the ball back to a certain position, which they will then hit a perfect shot from. So they're trying to set up their next shot. Why am I talking about tennis? Why am I talking about the Roger Federer system? Because the Roger Federer system applies to chairmen. And I bet you Roger Federer would be an awesome chairman's presenter. There's three ways to answer a question. If someone says, uh, why do you think your team deserves the chairman's award? You could just say something in response. Be like, um, because cows give milk. That's an answer. And uh, that's a really stupid example I just gave you, but a lot of times people will not even answer the question that's asked. You'll just say something back. That's the most basic thing. The next thing is you answer the specific question. You analyze the question that's been asked, and you answer it very directly. But the best, best strategy, and especially in a chairman's presentation, is to answer the specific question from the judge but then add something that emphasizes one of your key areas of focus. So we would always have like three areas that we would want to say, okay, we're going to focus on Symphonap, Degrassi, and uh, impact on the students. And every question answered, you would try and tie one question back to one of those things. So the question could be completely unrelated. But um, so for example, if we wanted to focus on alumni success, then this is something like, they say, oh, so what university do you want to go to next year? Basic question. Someone would just say, oh, I want to go to the University of Waterloo to study engineering. That's basic. That's simple. What 1114 student might have said, I want to go to the University of Waterloo to study engineering because a lot of our mentors and alumni have gone there, and when, while they were there, they helped found the Waterloo region. Ah, that goes back to a point that's in the, in the essay that you can tie back to. You want to tie facts into things that are important so you can sell your team a little bit more. Remember, you're trying to sell your team to the judges, what you do best, and you only have a certain amount of minutes. This is a chance to re-emphasize points. 
So you don't just want to answer the question. You want to answer the question and then add something on top of it to give the judges a better indication of what you're focusing on and give them something to remember. Practice, practice, practice. You must have a variety of people ask you questions and you have to try answering them out loud. It's not enough to just kind of say, oh, I'm ready for this. Have lots of different people ask questions, have them throw you curveballs, and then go into it. For the most part, the judges never ask super hard questions during the interviews. They're not trying to grill you. It's not an interrogation. They're not trying to trick you. They're not trying to make you slip up. So, you know, you don't need to be worried about that. But it's important to answer tough questions in preparation so then you'll be completely ready for whatever the judges are going to throw at you. Now, the judges can ask you about anything to do with the presentation or your essay or the history of your team. So the presenters need to know the content inside and out, not just the areas they worked on, but they must know the past and present history of the team, because a lot of the times stuff like that will come up. One of the things that's important about the Chairman's Award, it just doesn't go to the team who's done the most in the past year. We're talking about sustained excellence over a period of years. So there may be questions about things that were started on your team before you were even a student on that team. So you need to learn the history of your team and get very engrossed in this. We talked about rehearsing and answering questions, but you must rehearse the overall presentation. This is not something you can just wing. Well, I mean, you can, but you won't do a good job of it. Planned out and rehearsed. Now, some teams like to fully script the presentation. Some presenters like having a full script. I don't like having a full script. I like having each presenter with a bunch of point form notes of what they're going to talk about, and then they use their own words. Because if it's just a full script, you're going to get into the habit where you've memorized that script. And most students and young public speakers and, and, and old public speakers, when speaking off a script, end up sounding very robotic and unnatural and monotonous. It just sounds like they're reading, and most students who memorize a script end up sounding robotic and unnatural. The exception to this is drama students, who they, you know, they, they practiced a lot at reading scripts to say things with emotion. So, presenters with a deep understanding of the content and some point form notes will sound much more natural. And this is really, really important because you watch a lot of chairman's presentations, and it's just kind of like blah, 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 blah. And if you're monotonous, the judges will fall into the same rhythm that you're speaking in, and nothing's going to stand out and it will not stick in their memories as well as you can. So beware of monotony. Vary your intonation and add variety. Uh, it's a famous quote. I don't know who it's by, but you know they always say, uh, they may not re remember what you said, but they'll absolutely remember how you made them feel. And with your presentation, this is really important. To generate emotion and speak with passion. So the judges will remember that passion and that energy you had. They might not remember every single little thing you said, but they will remember the emotions you created, so that's really important. Also, make regular eye contact with the judges. You want to engage with them, even when you want talking. Like, if your co-presenter says something that's really important, make eye contact with one of the judges at that moment just so that it links. It's like, ah, we connected on this. I um, used to TA um, at the University of Waterloo, and it was really important for me that I would try and make eye contact with a couple students in the front row just because it was a good way of me being sure the class was listening. And just making eye contact with a couple people in the front row helped me engage with students all across the room. Also, look interested. You cannot see bored during the presentation. You will be bored because you will, if you've rehearsed this a lot, you've seen this presentation like 500 times. How many more times can you see it? You have to look engaged. You have to be smiling. You have to work the room. Okay, now we're over to the video. Um, we're almost done here, guys. I know we've been going for a while, and we will have a question period after this. Uh, it's, the video is a great way to tell the emotional story of the team. Like we said earlier, it's very difficult to tell emotions during a mere 10,000 character asset. You know, not everyone here is going to win a Pulitzer. So even in a live presentation, it takes a lot of skill to get emotion across. But with a video, you can edit it and tailor it however you want. So have fun with it, man. This is your team story. Be creative. Come up with something cool. Come up with something that really hits home. Uh, 
use the media for inspiration. Like a three minute video, that's about the length of a movie trailer or like a long commercial break or a couple commercials. That's what we've always used for inspiration on 1114. Well, not always. We only really mainly hit it properly in the last year. Our videos before that were not. And they were like, you know. So watch a bunch of movie trailers. Look at the one. What moves you? Which ones give you, you know, like, so like the, the hip kids say today, all the feels. You want to generate an emotional response. Um, our chairman's video was inspired by a, uh, an NBA commercial hyping the NBA playoffs. And that commercial, I know for me, it always hit me on a whoa. That's it gave me goosebumps. So I was like, could we make somehow make a chairman's video that would give people goosebumps? And that was our goal, and we feel we kind of did. I remember the first time our chairman's video played at GTR East we won, and it was just it it was crazy to look into the crowd and see the number of people that were crying because it was that emotional hit. And when we won a championships that year, I remember that, that night, so many people came up to me. It's like, oh, my God, your video made me cry. And we, like, your, your goal is not to make people cry, but it's, your goal is to have an emotional impact so that they will remember that. You want to leave behind the emotions of what's your team. Um, definitely want to use music in the video because music helps enhance any story, and music is such a powerful generator of emotions for humans. Your music must be free of copyright restrictions. So you can't just go and like use a Radiohead song. You know, you can't do that unless you know Tom York gives you permission to, which would be crazy. But yeah, so uh, we spent hours upon hours upon days looking for the right song for uh, the 1114 Chairman's videos, and we found some songs and we really liked them. But uh, we actually had to pay for the rights to use them. So we, it was you know. That was a resource we gave up. We just said, we'll spend a few hundred or a thousand or whatever it was to buy the rights to have this video, this music in the video, and it was definitely well worth it. Um, production values make up for a lot uh, when you're doing a video like this, so you want it to produce it as well as possible. It's crazy how easy it is. It's not easy, but there's so many tools available, and so many young people are so good at multimedia stuff right now. You, know, like you just pull out a Mac, and then suddenly, like, bam, 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 you can make a really professional-looking video. So you want to find kids who are excited about making movies and want to take this on. It's a huge project. The chairman's video in 2012, we spent nearly as much time on the video as we did on the robot. It was crazy how much time went into that video, and but it was well worth it. Um, here's a list of video examples. I know that um, James, who's moderating this for us, put some of these in the sidebar. The 1114 2012 Chairman's video is um, available on our YouTube channel, I think. So just go there, take a look at it, and there's other links. And I'll make sure that we get these links up on our Facebook page tonight so people can look at it. The Holy Cows in 2013 also had a fabulous video that was very inspirational. So those are things you can check out. Almost done. The Executive Summary. It's basically like your own checklist of the major criteria. Um, the executive summary items have a lot of duplication, so you have very few characters to work with. Do not duplicate the executive summary unless it's something super huge you want to drive home. But you've probably already driven it home in other areas. So use the executive summary to nicely provide, summarize what you've talked about, because it's a summary, but also to add in some extra points where you can that just didn't fit into the essay or didn't fit into the presentation. This is a great place for extra stats. Uh, point form is acceptable here, especially if you have a lot of information. If you don't have a lot of information, then use full sentences because you can afford to. Uh, full sentences always sound better than point form, but uh, point form can be effective for an executive, for this type of executive summary. And like I said, it's a great spot to fit in facts that kind of felt out of place in the essay or the presentation. Extras, things that you can do, things that you should do. Um, uh, you can create buzz about your team via social media. You want to get lots of people, especially if you want to win the championship level. You want people talking about your submission going into the championship. So you want to be known as a chairman's team throughout the year, post about things that you've done. Well, first of all, it's helping achieve a culture change. Secondly, it's communicating to the rest of the first community so the first community can be inspired and then start to look to you as a role model. And thirdly, it's, just, it's a great way to create buzz about your team. So use social media to talk about what you've done. 
uh, it's nice to give something to the judges. We always provided a booklet, which I'll show you when I come off the full screen, the booklet that we handed out, which was, it was our entire submission content. So it was like a copy of the essay, but then it had all the supporting material in our virtual footnotes that verified our numbers. And it had letters from teams that basically, it was a bunch of testimonials from teams who said, hey, we believe 1114 deserves to win the 2012 Chairman's Award. And so we had fellow Hall of Fame team, well, they weren't fellow Hall of Fame teams then, uh, Degrassi and various people uh, write some awesome letters. Uh, the whole idea of the virtual footnotes, this is an idea concept that um, was brought to us by Team 341, Miss Daisy, when they won in 2010, was it? Yeah, 2010. They did something that was called Daisy by the Numbers, which was basically a breakdown of all the verifiable numbers that Daisy had. So it, they kind of, that was like the first that I've really seen of the virtual footnotes, and it was such an inspiration to us, and we had such a great idea, and they said, hey, Thinbox, you need to do this because you have so many numbers. So full credit to another Hall of Fame team on that one. Um, visuals are good to have to give to the judges, just like a collage of pictures of your team. That's a kind of cool thing. Handouts in the pit are cool. You want to spread the word about your program. Um, judging is solely based on your essay interview presentation, all that sort of stuff. However, it doesn't hurt to impress the other judges in the pit. Like, Chairman's Award is not going to be won or lost in the pit. There's a lot of teams who kind of have that misnomer, and it's not really true. If the presentation is like where the bulk of it happens. Um, final thoughts. Chairman's Award process needs to be fun. If it starts to feel like a chore, you need to reevaluate why you're submitting and go back to the very beginning and think about why we're doing these things and what's happening. There hit a point on 11-14 where it was no longer fun to work on chairmen's back in about 2009. And we reevaluated in 2010, we focused, and then that changed the culture of our team permanently. So make sure things are fun. Always remember what the award is meant to recognize. We're looking for the best role model team who's done the best job of fulfilling the mission of first and achieving a culture change. The goal here is not to win the award. The goal is culture change. This is the idealism and coming back again. If you want to make, if you make real strides towards a culture change, and you are a role model team, and you document it well, the award will come in time. We'll get there. But if you don't win the award, remember. The bigger picture here, oh, sorry about the hiccups. The bigger picture here is achieving culture change to fulfilling the mission of first. All right, we're done. So resources, um, Simbot Facebook page, Simbot Twitter, that's a great place to ask questions. If you want to contact me directly, you can email me, you can tweet at me. Um, our website has our entire 2012 submission. It has the essay, it has the presentation boards, it has the video. I wish it had video of our actual presentation, but somehow we are a, a smart team, but we're also a dumb team, and we managed to never record our presentation, ever. And that 2012 chairman's presentation, which I thought was our best presentation ever, it was flipping, I, I'm so proud of it, never to be seen again. So we do have the script of the presentation somewhere, but we don't actually have a video of that presentation, which kind of sucks. Anyways, that's the presentation, so now it's time for questions. So you can ask questions in the Q&A uh, app that we have on uh, Google+, Plus, or you can go tweet them at us. We'll have someone check out our, our Twitter and our Facebook page, or you can even post them on Chief in the Chief thread. So let me get you out of this infinite loop here. Uh, stop screen share. There we go. And now I will jump over to the Q&A panel. First, I'm going to drink water while the Q&A panel loads up. And there are very few questions right now, which might make this really fast. It also makes you wonder if anyone was actually watching tonight. It would be funny if I just did this long presentation and there was no one watching. That would be embarrassing. James, you're nodding your head at me. I'm nervous that there was actually no one watching. Oh, God, he's shaking his head. Five people? Oh, five zero. Okay. I, like, if there was five people watching, that, I really should have been watching the World Series. Um, here's our 
booklet that we handed to the judges. This, and you can see the various letters and stuff doesn't come up that clearly, but yeah. Okay, so there's only one question, which is uh, borderline hilarious. Uh, you speak of going into previous experiences of your team. How would a second year team go about this? What would they replace it with? Well, they wouldn't replace it with anything. You should just talk about what you've done in the history of your team. Uh, it is difficult for a second year team to win this award. However, it's really important that if you want to win the award in the future, to start the process early and then keep going on. So you would focus on exactly what you've done. Uh, could you show the handout you talked about? Yeah, I can. Here, here it is again. This is it. It was a booklet. It's like about 100 pages or so. And it shows the various things that are like, uh, I'm not good at this stuff. Like you can see it has all the slides from the presentation board. Um, it has letters like, uh, there's a letter from school, from our minister of parliament, school board officials talking about the impact the teams had, the city, a school in Germany that we worked with, uh, 2056. You know, various FRC teams sent us letters. Like, this is all, there's, like if you go through just the letters, it's like 1503, 1547, 20. It's, it's a, it was pretty humbling to receive all these letters of support from so many teams across uh, first who said, you know, said that we impacted them and we made a difference for them. But that's basically what this is. And then clipping, newspaper article clippings are in here. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. How would help convince students who have previously been on the team that the chairman's award is fun if in previous years they have had bad experiences with it? Well, I, I you need to make it fun. The process needs to, um, so you, you would have to talk about specifically why it is fun on your team and what, uh, what goes into it. So talk about how you do things, like uh, with our chairman's team, um, like they had like a little room they worked in that they called the cave and they had a really fun environment. So like, I mean, some people aren't going to enjoy this stuff. Like writing an essay is not necessarily, oh, there's a bunch of questions. Writing an essay is not necessarily fun for a lot of people. So you have to talk about the whole package and talk about the importance of the award. But if the leaders on the team, and I believe this is firm for everything to do at first, if the leadership of the team believes in something and is enthusiastic and passionate about it, the rest of the teams will kind of follow from that. So I know that's not necessarily the best answer, but I guess if people have had bad experiences in the past, you want to show that you have a clean slate from the start. We're not going to repeat any of the things that created the bad experiences in the past. You think building a robot or doing outreach is more important for an FRC team? Um, I, I, building a robot is clearly uh, more important. Like, first teams are not outreach vehicles. First teams build a robot to compete in the competition, and they use the robot as a vehicle to help achieve culture change. So I think absolutely building ro a robot is more important. Uh, there will be some people who disagree with me on this one, but I just think that your team, so if, your sole, if your sole focus is outreach, and you're not, like, you can be a first team with a robot without a chairman's submission. You can't really be a first team with a chairman's award and not a robot. So building a robot is more important. Uh, in your view, how much does location matter for where a team submits chairmen, especially with the advent of being able to submit at multiple regionals? Uh, well, since you can submit at multiple regionals, um, I mean, you're going to submit pretty much everywhere you go, so location is not as big of a factor as it used to be. However, there are some teams who may try and choose their regionals based on which regionals they think will be easier to win a chairman's award at. I think that's kind of a dangerous game because I think most teams in general don't really know which teams are going to be super strong at chairmans from which year. But at the same time, I guess there's certain events you want to avoid because there's some teams who've been consistently good for so long. Um, flip side of that is that there's a lot of teams who had long streaks of consecutive chairmans awards that have been broken in the past two years. So it's not as easy to consistently win over and over again. So I think that I would never be choosing regionals based on uh, where teams are submitting chairmen on at or choosing a district event. And I think that now that you can submit at multiple places, just try 
give it your best shot. I mean, yeah, like one our strategy for picking where we submitted uh, back in the day was actually not based on what regionals we were going to, but it was based on when the regional was. Because we always preferred to submit, um, 2006 to 2011, we preferred to submit late in the season because late in the season meant it was after our district's spring break, and so the kids could have a full spring break week to work on the chairman's presentation. In 2012, we flipped that switch, and we wanted to present at our first event, because we said our goal was to win the championship chairman's award, and we want to have as much time to make changes after our chairman's presentation to get things right for championship. So we said even if we're going to have a weaker submission to start off with, we're going to present early, hopefully win, and then have lots of time and that whole spring break to work on our presentation for championship. So, tailored it that way. Again, now that you submit in multiple places, it's like irrelevant. Uh, do you think that robot performance influences winning the award? I ask this because teams like 11, 14, 341, 359, 1538, 67, 254, 111, and 27 were all highly competitive in the years they wanted champs. Uh, I think it's more that just the correlation between teams to have, have good robots are also doing good things in the community. Like, I, just think, I don't think that robot performance matters at all to the judges. Uh, I think it is easier, though. If you have a good robot, it is easier for you to get attention in your community, and it's easier to achieve culture change and have real impacts, because teams with good robots are more sustainable, um, their robots are more attractive for the media and the such, and so I think that's why you see the correlation between successful team and success, successful robot performance and successful chairmen. Uh, I don't think the judges pay attention at all to that. And whether they should or not is another story. So, I mean, like, the other thing to think about is the award is going to the team who is the best role model for other teams. It is hard to be a good role model in FRC without a good robot. So, there's that to think about, too. What's the best way to get other teams' attention and to allow your team to become an inspiration to others? Well, uh, not to give a flippant answer, but I think the best way to become an inspiration to others is to do inspiring things. If you want to do things, if you want to get attention to other teams, do things that will capture their attention. Do things that will make your fellow teams say, wow, that is awesome. Uh, a good chairman's video is a good way to advertise this, but you want to be talking, you want to do things that, like, we're talking about being the best role model. You want teams to look up to you, so you need to do things that teams will look up to. So you want to look at the things that, in first, that teams typically uh, aspire to, and you want to try and do that. I know uh, we first got on a chairman's kick after the championships in 2004 when we saw Team 254 uh, with the chairman's award. And we were really moved by what the judges said about them, and we realized, wow, like, 254 was already our inspiration, but seeing them enter the Hall of Fame back 12 years ago, we were like, we need to do this stuff too. And we were so impressed with how they started so many teams and how they were both effective on the field and in their community. That's what inspired us. So to become an inspiration to others, to do inspiring things and, and make sure teams know what you're doing because by getting out in the community and getting out in the FRC community and showing the world what's going on. Next question. Is there a good way to integrate the build students into the chairman's team? Uh, yes. There, it's important to do, and the way you do it is you can't have the two teams exist as like two separate areas. They need to overlap. Like the Venn diagram has to link. So your student leadership, like who our team presidents are, like our, one of our rules was if you are a team president or co-president on 1114, you have to be on the robot sub-team and the chairman's sub-team. This only happened after the 2010 ch change in our team, but it made a huge, huge difference. So it's important that your build leaders are involved in chairman's in some way or another, or at least know what's going on, and then can talk about it with the rest of the team. Uh, should age matter when choosing presenters? Uh, yes and no. There's a huge difference in maturity between a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old. No doubt. 
18, 17 and 18 year olds, your seniors, are more likely to be better presenters. However, one of the best ways to become a better presenter is practice and have more repetitions. So we, uh, like on 11-14, we had one presenter who um, did five years of high school and he presented in grades 9, 10, 11, and 13. And he was very good when he was in grade 9, but we put him on the, I may have a chairman's presenter in grade 9 for two reasons. One, we saw the potential in him, but two, we was like, this is a long-term thing. He could be flipping awesome by the end. And by the end, he was just phenomenal. So, yes, there's something to be said about putting a young presenter in to gain them experience and get them to grow as the team grows. And also having a presenter who's presented a bunch of times will know more about the team history and be that subject matter expert. But you shouldn't throw them in unless they're ready and unless they are a top-notch uh, presenter. Uh, how would you suggest we start the culture change on our team? Um, I, I have always said that culture change flows from leadership. So if you want to change your team to the point where the whole team respects what the chairman's award is about, the leaders of the team need to respect that. Whether, and some teams have dominant student team leaders, others have dominant mentor leaders. So you know, you got to look at your own team, figure out who is who the dominant leaders are, and have, get the dominant leaders to buy into chairmans and then express their passion for this award to the rest of the team. So if you are on a very mentor-driven team, then I think it's very important for the lead mentor to get behind chairmans and broadcast it. If you're on, if, you're, if your lead mentor or your lead students aren't into chairmans, the rest of the team won't be either. The culture change has to start at the top. Uh, how does a team develop rapport with teams in order to get the support letters and also help in chairman submissions? Well, if you want a team to give you a support letter, you probably should have been doing things to help them along the way. Okay, so that they would say, hey, this team's been really helpful to us. It's not like you're just going to go, hey, random team, can you support us for the chairman's award? Like that's, it's about actually, like the letters are, aren't the important part. The important part is actually doing things to help teams and start teams and mentor teams, you know? so. Uh, reminds me of something. One of the things that's talked about a lot in chairman submissions is teams say, we mentored this many teams. What does that mean? Judges are looking for more than the statement, we mentored seven teams. They want a definition of what mentorship means to you. Because for some teams, mentoring means, you know, hey, we visited this team once during the year. And that's not to say that's a bad thing. That's a one form of mentorship. But for other teams, mentorship is this team worked in our shop for the whole year. Three of our students were assigned to this team at competition and worked with them directly. So you want to define your different levels of mentorship and I think that's a thing a lot of teams miss. But yeah, in order to develop a rapport, like go mentor other teams, network with other teams. Uh, when 11-14 won in 2012, did you draw any attention to the fact that it was your 10th season or did you just focus on the facts? Uh, we pretty much just focused on the facts. The only real tie-in to our 10th year is that our 10th year helped create the theme that we had, which was the uh, Symbotics Museum, because it was like, you know, this is our 10th year, so let's go through the history of our team. That's why we came up with that theme. But other than that, in the, in the theming, um, it was very, it would have been irrelevant if it was our 9th year, 11th year, or 7th year. How would you decide who should do the presentation? Uh, what should be done to help the presenters practice to get better at the chairman's presentation? So we talked about this uh, during the, uh, the webinar uh, where the most important things in a chairman's presenter is they need to be passionate about the award and really believe in it. They need to be enthusiastic and outgoing, and they need to be good at public speaking. And they also have to have an intimate knowledge of the history of the team. So that's how you you're going to look for students who meet that sort of criteria. What can be done to help presenters practice to get better at the chairman's presentation? Well, one, they should practice presentation repeatedly. And two, um, public learning about public speaking. You could do public speaking courses, but I just want one of the most basic things is, is, and this can be done in your spare time. Like if you say, I'm going to dedicate 15 minutes every day to watch a different TED Talk. And you'll watch a lot of different speakers out there. 
and you'll learn about presenting. They could even watch my TED Talk. No, I'm kidding. But no, you could just watch speakers. I talked about watching old presidential speeches. You know, like it's it's a neat thing to do. But the best way to get to become a better public speaker, aside from practicing, is to uh, watch other public speakers. Now, in terms of practicing, it's one thing to just to practice with a small group of people, but uh, you can have set up presentations for them where, like, they present in front of a sponsor or they present at a school assembly. So they're presenting in big groups, intimidating groups, to help them develop their presenting skills. You talked about how some teams have a divide between the robot section of the team and the awards uh, section, and how that's often detrimental to the quality of the submissions. How does one go about bridging that gap without forcing people into awards? Um, again, this one ties back into what I was saying earlier. It really comes down to leadership, where if the leadership of the team is not just focused on the robot, but they're also focused on chairmans, then it'll help the younger members of the team uh, kind of get engaged in that. So the culture kinds of shifts that way. Chairmen should not operate in their own little box. It's very easy for that to happen because, you know, it's hard to have everyone working on it. You can have 20 people working on a robot, but it's hard to have 20 people working on a chairman's submission. So if only a small group of students is working on the chairman's submission in isolation, that's dangerous. So one way to bridge the gap is to have the chairman's team give regular updates to the rest of the team so the rest of the team knows what's going on. Have the chairman's team try and involve as many people as possible. One of the neat things that we did in 2012, and this was accidental, but when we were working on a chairman's video, our video featured interviews with all our students. Every single one of our students and mentors had to do an interview on camera and talking about what the team means to them and a bunch of things. And having them all work on that part of the video got everyone that much more engaged with chairman's. But I think it's important that you have, if your five kids on the chairman's sub team don't work on the robot at all, and there's no kids from the robot sub team that work on chairman's, it's very easy to have that gap. So you want to try and bridge that gap with overlap and really attention from uh, the leaders on the team, whether it be the student captains or the lead mentors, the drive coach or the teacher. It's so, so important for them to buy into it. And I, I can't stress this enough. If you have a team president or a, um, a lead mentor who doesn't believe in the chairman's award or is one of those like people who are like he or she will be like, ah, the chairman's award is dumb, no one cares about this, it is going to be hard to create that culture on your team. And that's, you're, you're, working, you're fighting an uphill battle there. Do you think presenters should take some time out of the presentation to give personal experience or anecdotes or spend the full time presenting the team? This is a really good question. Because, um, Anecdotes are very valuable in uh, talking, in conveying how much impact the team has had. I definitely think you should avoid the anecdotes in the essay unless you are short on content. I think the essay you stay mainly factual stuff, but I don't think it hurts to have an anecdote or two or three in the presentation, provided that the anecdote ties back to the main points you're talking about. The anecdote cannot be unrelated. It needs to tie into the keys that you're looking at. Now, another way to do it is to try and work the anecdote into the question period. Uh, one of the most common questions you'll always get is, uh, for the presenters, uh, what do you want to do when you graduate? What are your plans uh, when you leave this team? So, People will always talk about what university or what college they want to go to or what job they want to have. That's a perfect place to work an anecdote in. And this is what we talked about the game of tennis. A simple answer would be, say, like, oh, I want to go to the University of Waterloo. A better answer would be, I want to go to the University of Waterloo because while being on Team 1114, um, I learned a lot about statistics and analytics uh, by being on the scouting sub team. And that was just such a, a cool thing that I learned about. And some of my mentors were very involved in doing data analysis in their day job. I realized, wow, that's the day job that I could partially be a part of. So I went to Waterloo where I'm studying mathematical statistics. And so that's a way to work an anecdote in that is real and you can be passionate about and ties into the content of uh, your presentation. So I do think anecdotes fit well in the presentation. I think they can be best utilized in the question period. Can you please expand on how to speak with judges in the pit? Um, 
I, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, you use words and talk to them. I mean, how to speak to the judges in the pit. So, first of all, talking to the judges in the pit is not a big chunk of the chairman's process. It, it, for the most part, the judging is all done in the presentation room. However, judges come to the pits all the time, but, and it's important for other awards, like the Engineering Inspiration Award, the GP Award, so talking to the judges is important. So the judges will come and answer the question, ask you questions, and you need to deal with it the way you would deal with questions in the chairman's presentation, where you answer their question directly, but then you give them additional information about something. I think team, it's important for teams to focus on certain awards. And when you focus on those awards, so if the judges ask you a question about, you know, like, say, entrepreneurship, but your team doesn't really have a focus on entrepreneurship, you could talk instead about something you've done that has to do with sportsmanship. So you answer the question directly, but then tie it in with something else. So talking to judges in the pit is just like answering questions in the question and answer period. What sort of practice did 1114 do with the competition for presentation? Was the practice schedule different at regionals versus championships? Uh, at regionals, the biggest and championship, the biggest thing we used was that uh, the fact that there's you know 30 to 60 other teams or 400 te other teams in attendance with you, and so we would present to as many other teams as we could. We like to present teams that knew us well. We also like to present the teams who didn't know us at all, just to get their opinion. At the championship, we really geared things up, and we tried to present to as many Hall of Fame teams as possible, because they've been through this process. They know what it takes to win the award. So we wanted to talk to them, and we wanted to ask them flat out, is this the presentation that can win at championship? And we had uh, good feedback year, some years, and we had... Um, like, I think the best feedback we ever got was uh, from Team 103, from Kathy and Cassie Beck. Uh, 103 got in the Hall of Fame in 2003. And they gave us some rough feedback. They just said, they said, you need to improve this, this, and this. That was amazing for us. I, so many people that you present for won't give you critical feedback. They'll just say, oh, this is amazing, this is great. But that critical feedback was better than, like, 15 other presentations we did for people who just said, oh, this is amazing, this is great. So... Uh, presenting to, to past Hall of Fame teams was one of the best things we did. We did it every year, and even at the beginning when we had Mushad winning the Championship Pyramids Award, and it was cool to present to the same teams and the same people year after year to get their feedback on how the team had improved from year to year. And it was really cool, you know, in 2012 when we present to a Hall of Fame team and they just be like, this is your year. Like, you're, you're right there. So, uh, the way we ramped it up in championship is definitely presentations for towards um, the Hall of Fame teams and to various VIPs and people with a lot of first experience. Uh, what do you think of themes for chairman's present presentations? What themes are effective? Um, again, we talked a lot about themes uh, on one of the slides earlier in the presentation, so I don't want to rehash too much of it. Uh, themes that have been effect themes that are effective are any theme that helps unify all the various areas of your presentation and makes things a little bit more seamless and that are memorable for the judges. I don't like silly themes, and I don't like themes for the sake of just being there. So I think it's important that what you're doing is professional, and I, yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan of like some of the silliness that some teams do. Uh, any wagers for chairmen at Champs in 2015? Uh, no, I, I mean, there's a lot of teams who are doing some awesome things out there. Uh, team 1311, Kells Robotics, uh, they're one of the lesser known chairman's teams, but man, they have made dynamic changes and really affect culture change out in their area. So 1311 is a team that I think is on the cusp. I think Team 987 out in uh, Vegas is on the cusp, and those are two teams who are lesser known for their chairman's feats than others. And then there's like the, the traditional contenders, the 234s, the 340s, the 1511s. The, those are the ones that I interact with a lot, so I'm familiar with a team that I barely even, I've never really spoke to or barely have spoken to, but Team 1108 from Kansas. I've just heard amazing things about them, and they've won a bajillion chairman's awards in a row. In a row. The Killer Bees, Frog Force, there's so many great teams. It's, it's hard to make a wager on, and I think it's much more wide open.
for a few years, it was pretty clear going into the championships who the contenders were. And it was like knocking teams off the list. But I think after like Daisy, Hawaiian Kids, and 11-14 won, things really, really opened up. So I think that it's anyone's game. So uh, no real wager there. I, the wagers I'm thinking about tonight, I'm thinking that the Cleveland Cavaliers are not going to finish first in the East in the NBA. I think it's going to be the Bulls. I think the Bulls will probably get them by a couple games. There's a wager for you. If your team is in the district format, should you modify your presentation after winning a district before the regional? Um, I think it's very important to change your presentation after you win at a regional before championship because at the regional level you want to focus on things that are very specific to your region while at the championship you want to tailor things like you need to make sure things that are explained there's things that some things that everyone in your region might understand but at the championship they might not that was very important to us as a Canadian team because a lot of things we talked about were very school um, Canada specific so we had to explain them in a little bit more detail to American judges uh, Things that people in our area had heard over and over and over again from us, well, at the championship level, they hadn't heard them over and over again, so we were able to bring some of those things back. Now, when you're talking from district to district championship, I've never been part of a district system, so I'm not too sure, but my feeling is it shouldn't take too much of a change because it's the same sort of region, so there's not going to be regional biases in play, so I would think that you kind of leave things um, alone. But You'd obviously want to iterate based on things that you did wrong at the district level. You want to improve on them for the district championship. One other thing, the chairman's feedback form, that's the best piece of feedback you're going to get. Now that you can present multiple times, read that feedback form and take it to heart and improve things for your next event. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Karthik. It's always a pressure to learn from your always a pleasure to learn from your experience and all this robotics. Thank you, Panteris. Hey, speaking of a contender for a championship chairman's award, Panteris is doing amazing things down in Mexico, and they're a team that I would say is uh, on the cusp. And I mean, it'd be cool to have all of North America represented in the Hall of Fame someday soon. So we'd love to see Panteris join that team there. Last year, we were told that one event we were too formal. And then at the other event, we were too informal. What would you say is a good level of formalness? Well, I think sometimes our judges are a little bit silly about the feedback they give, and I wish that they had a central database for their feedback so they wouldn't give teams contradicting information. Um, I think you hit the level of too formal when it seems like the students on the team, not just the presenters, but the entire team, aren't having fun. So. I think it's important to be formal, but if you're no longer smiling and you're no longer having fun, I think you've hit the point of being too formal because this is still an event for teenagers. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be exciting. So I'd say that's the level you want to play with. On 11-14, we definitely got the ding. Of, we, our presenters didn't get the ding of being too formal, but, um, I, well, they kind of did. Like, we just didn't for a lot of years didn't show the right amount of enthusiasm. And it was more of a problem for our, our drive team and our kids in the pit who were just like so businesslike and we had some kids who just refused to smile and that was actually hurting us towards winning the chairman's award. So you want to make sure everyone's having fun and that they look like they're having fun. Now remember, this is still a competition. Like, you know, you're, you're there to win matches so you're not going to be smiling all the time but your team can't look miserable. So misery is too formal. Uh, how would you handle your chairman's presenters also being on the drive team? How would they manage the time available to their presenting? Uh, we never allowed 1114 chairman's presenters to be on the drive team and vice versa. You would have to pick and choose just because the conflict was too difficult to deal with. So um, we tried this in 2006 where one of our presenters was one of our drivers and we never tried it again afterwards. It was just too much to deal with. So. Uh, that's how we dealt with it. So, uh, any final questions, anyone? I'm going to give you guys a chance to drop them in here. Are there any questions on Twitter? I'm going to just check our little internal chat here. A uh, question from Twitter. Anthony Galea asks, if the team wants, could a, team, could a team's chairman's team have lighter tone or should it take a more serious tone? It's okay to have a lighter tone but just don't be silly. Like, you don't want to be, you, it's okay to be lighter and have some fun with it, 
but there's a fine line between fun and then goofy and silly. So you don't want it to just be over the top. Like there was one team up here who did their presentation and their whole concept was based around uh, like super nerds. And so they were dressed up like really nerdy and whatever. And the judges did not like it at all. Number one, because first isn't about just appealing to nerds. So the judges were turned off by that because first is about trying to appeal to everyone. So you shouldn't just focus on nerds. But it, I think the judges thought it was a little bit too over the top. So theming, it, it, having fun with a the theme means your presenter is going to have more fun. You know, like you know, if you do something like you're whistling when you walk in or you're singing, you know, that's that's okay. But don't let it become silly and don't let your theme detract from your content. If at the end of the presentation the judges don't remember what you said or how you made them feel, but they just remember the theme, that means your theme's too overpowering. Okay, it looks like we are all out of questions, and it's gonna pause. I know there's a little bit of a delay here, so I'm gonna just wait a couple seconds to see if there are any more questions that pop up. Um, but it looks like we're gonna be finished up for the day here. Uh, tune in next week for our final episode of the Simbot Seminar Series. We're going to go on a totally different note. Oh, we do have one more question, but let me just say this final note. Next week, we're going to talk about the beta test. Uh, team 1114 has been lucky enough to be one of the teams who's been testing the new control system for first. We're going to talk about all our new findings, everything we know about the new control system, and share that with the community. So that's going to be a good presentation next week, Wednesday at 9 p.m., not during Game 7 of the World Series. Uh, you said we need to figure out our priority list. What would you say is higher priority? Starting FLL teams or starting and mentoring FRC teams? That's a hard one to say. I think it's pretty equal. I think it's easier to show big impact with uh, mentoring FRC teams. I think your focus should be on what you can do to set yourself apart more. So. If you want to dedicate resources to one or the other, would the resources go further to start to get more accomplished within the FLL community or more accomplished in the FRC community? And I think picking or choosing based on that is probably best. Uh, would cheese puns be over the top in your opinion for a team like Blue Cheese? Uh, no, I don't think cheese puns would be over the top. I, I mean, maybe if you don't make cut the cheese pun, that would be a little bit uncomfortable. But yeah, no, I think. Uh, that's probably fine. It ties in with your team branding, so it's applicable, you know? Like I know um, 1902 Exploding Bacon kind of ties things into that, so I think it ties in with your team name. I mean, just use the, the, the sense check. When like people watch your presentation or see your theme, if they roll their eyes, you've probably gone too far. Uh, no further seminars? Yeah, it looks like this is going to, the beta test one's going to be the last one. Um, I think we've, we've covered a lot of topics, and We've kind of hit the point with the resources on our team that we're kind of where we're at. Uh, we're going to look at doing some interesting stuff during build season, though. I really like this Google Hangout technology, and we're thinking about maybe doing some open sessions on Saturdays and Sundays of build season where a couple of important students and mentors will jump on one of these Hangouts, and then people can just ask questions in a Q&A about, like, hey, how do you think I should do this this year, and effective things for this and that. So uh, the Simbot Seminar Series is going to be done for the fall, but we're oh, uh, this technology makes it so easy to give presentations that we might do some other interactive things with the community. But other than that, guys, um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, good luck with everything this season. We wish you success, and uh, we will talk to you all soon. Good night.